Hello, and thank you very much for joining my conversation with Condoleezza Rice. Uh, I'm a professor of economics at Stanford, and over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk with many Stanford faculty on some of the deep challenges facing the U.S. as we approach the elections like racial injustice, income inequality, uh, and immigration. But uh, before we are going to delve into each of these important topics in the coming weeks, I thought it would be wonderful to, to get to ask Condoleezza some uh, big picture questions. Uh, Condoleezza, of course, has a unique perspective on some of these challenges as someone who is both a Stanford professor and served at the highest levels of government. Uh, Condoleezza is a chaired professor of political science at Stanford, a real expert on Russia and the Soviet Union. She is also a former national security advisor and secretary of state. And we are very fortunate at Stanford that Condoleezza has just started as the new director of the Hoover Institution. So thank you very much, Condi, for joining me this morning. It's a pleasure to be with you, Fran, very much. Uh, there will be many students listening to our conversation. So I wanted to start maybe with asking you your advice for students as they decide what to study or what to research. And let me briefly just give you my perspective. When I came to the US for my graduate studies at Northwestern, I remember many people thought the Israeli kibbutz was a, <laughs> was a somewhat odd choice of a topic for a PhD in economics, but I was really passionate about it and ended up writing my dissertation on the kibbutz anyway. And ever since then, I always tell my students to go with their heart when they choose what to study or what to research. Now, I bet some people raised their eyebrows when you decided to study the Soviet Union and obviously things turned out just fine for you. So I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to study Russia and what advice do you have for, for students? Well, my advice is very much like yours, which is that you have to do something that really energizes you and that you love. But of course, the first thing that energized me was to be a concert pianist. So I was actually a failed piano major when I found the Soviet Union. I'd studied piano from the age of three. I was going to uh, be a great concert pianist. At the end of my sophomore year in college, it suddenly occurred to me that I was pretty good, not great. I was probably going to end up teaching 13-year-olds to murder Beethoven for a living. And so fortunately for me, Ron, I walked into a course in international politics looking for a major. It was taught by a man named Joseph Corbell. He was Madeleine Albright's father, oddly oh. enough. And uh, he was an East European former diplomat, and he opened up this world to me of the Soviet Union and things international and diplomatic. And I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be a specialist in international politics. And I would just say two things about that lesson to the students. The first is finding something that you're absolutely just thrilled to get up and want to do in the morning. That's really the key, I think, to a happy professional life. The other point is, it's your passion. Don't let anybody tell you that because you look a particular way or you come from a particular background, why in the world should a black girl from Birmingham, Alabama want to be a specialist on international politics in the Soviet Union? But it was my passion. And so um, I think you have to, yes, you said you have to go with your heart. This is great. And I hear you're quite a good pianist, by the way. So I think you're not doing much justice for yourself <laughs> here. But, you know, let, let's, let's talk about, uh, about income inequality for a second. So You've done, obviously, a lot of research on the Soviet Union and spent some time there, if I recall correctly, in your 20s. I know this experience did not make you believe more in socialism. But then we also both know that the free market capitalism isn't the perfect system either. For example, there's a rise in income inequality in the U.S. over the last few decades, and many people are wondering whether we can create a more equal society. Do you think income inequality is a problem in the U.S., and do you have suggestions of, of how to reduce it? I definitely think that income inequality and social immobility uh, are problems for uh, the United States. Let me, first of all, uh, speak to the socialist issue. Um, as you know, uh, because you also know these issues as an economist, the, the Marxist notion that it should be from each according to his talents and to each according to his needs, that's only worked at gunpoint. It's only worked when you took people's liberty to do that. And it didn't work very well. It didn't work in the Soviet Union. Uh, people say, well, it's working in China. No, a very different system in China where Deng Xiaoping actually had to go to a more capitalist economic model 
to be able to bring uh, equality and to bring greater social and income uh, mobility to his own people. So I think we can agree, or I believe, that as a system, uh, capitalism which incents people uh, to work hard, uh, to be innovative, uh, to create jobs in the private sector, not depending on the government, that's a, the best economic system for the allocation of resources so that you get growth. But then you have to have a social contract as to how people are actually going to benefit from the overall macroeconomic conditions. And that's, I think, where we are falling down in the United States. Too many people are trapped in uh, low wage, low skill jobs. Too many people are trapped, um, unable to move up the, the ladder. And my view is that what has always made it possible to have uh, income uh, equality, to have social mobility, is access to a high quality education. And today, that access to a high quality education is more important than it's ever been because the skills that it takes to be uh, successful in a highly automated, highly innovative economy like the United States has, those skills are getting to be more and more difficult to acquire if you don't have access early on in K-12 to a uh, high quality education. And so, uh, my answer is let's go and fix that problem. And I think we will start to see some impacts on uh, income inequality. Yeah, education is completely agree. It's incredibly important. But let me ask you also, we, we know, for example, that countries like Norway and Sweden uh, have been able to successfully combine free markets with comprehensive welfare state. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we both know that these countries are more homogeneous and less diverse in the United States, perhaps making it easier for them to sustain lower levels of income inequality. But do you think that uh, some version of the Nordic model can, can work in the United States or completely uh, impossible? If, if you've ever been to Norway or Sweden uh, or Denmark, they're wonderful places, but they're tiny. And they're actually very homogeneous. Um, and um, I wouldn't trade the um, energy of a diverse, large America, which is innovative at levels that no other, in, no other uh, country's ever been, for the, the kind of small safety, if you will, of the Nordic countries. I love them, I worked with them, but they're not the United States of America. And so I've always found the comparisons to these small homogeneous countries not very helpful. So I say, what is it that the United States has done in the past that has made uh, it possible to escape class, to escape, uh, to, to actually believe that your life can be better than your parents or your grandparents? And again, for me, it goes back to equal access to certain very important elements in life. One is education, one is healthcare. We do need to do more about access to healthcare. Um, my own passion, of course, is education because I saw what it did for my family. So um, I'm actually not even the first PhD in my family. Now, when you look at me and I'm a black woman from Alabama, people are sometimes surprised by that. My aunt was a PhD in Victorian literature. She got her degree at the University of Wisconsin in 1952. She wrote books on Dickens. Now you think what I do is kind of strange for a black person, she wrote books on Dickens, right? Uh, my grandfather went to college. He was a sharecropper's son who decided he was going to get an education in book learning. He went to Stillman College, a little Presbyterian college in Tuscaloosa, and he made a deal. If he became a minister, they'd let him go to school for free. He became a minister. We have been educated and Presbyterian ever since. So to me, education and my family, education was kind of the holy grail. And when I look these days, at a kid and I say, can I look at your zip code and tell whether you're gonna get a good education? And I say, yes, I can look at your zip code and tell whether you're gonna get a good education. That's where we're falling down. It's that, not that we're not Sweden or Norma, Norway, it's we aren't what the United States used to be with excellent schools, whatever your station in life, with skills and vocational training, if you weren't gonna go on to a four-year degree, that's where we're falling down, not in trying to copy countries that are much smaller and less homogeneous. 
on the issue of uh, racial injustice. Uh, after the horrific death of George Floyd and the shock and grief that many Americans experienced, you said that uh, when you grew up in segregated Jim Crow, Alabama, if a black man was shot by a policeman, it wouldn't even have been a footnote in the newspaper. Uh, what, what do you think are some of the key actions necessary to promote racial justice and make our system more fair in that regard? Well, let me start with the, the justice system and policing. And um, clearly, we need to make reforms to the way that we police communities, particularly uh, diverse communities and troubled communities. And um, there are a lot of people who uh, think about uh, more national ways to figure out if there's a bad cop. Uh, the, the cop in the case of George Floyd, I think it had something like 16 or 17 complaints. What, what was he still doing on the force? Uh, it's the fact that uh, if you're going to treat somebody the way that George Floyd was treated, you have to think of them as less than a human being to do that. And so clearly our training and our reforms of police uh, is important. And, and by the way, I'm a, an advocate. I don't believe in defunding the police, but I would like to see us think about what should the police be doing and what might others be doing. Um, is domestic violence something that needs more than policing? Because we know that that's a more complex issue. Uh, when you go into a community that is uh, troubled, uh, how can you get the support of the community to isolate the really bad elements? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done, done in policing and in justice reform. Clearly the fact that so many black males are incarcerated is uh, a sign that something's wrong. And so I'm for reform of all of that. When I think about race, I think about the fact that we were, as the United States of America, birth defect, slavery. And uh, we've never quite been able to deal with what that meant. Uh, I am, my, my DNA is 40% European. My grandmother, my great grandmother was the daughter of the slave owner. Race is visceral in a way in America that almost nothing else is. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of pain to go around in the way that Jewish Americans were treated, that um, Asian Americans were treated, that uh, certainly Mexican Americans were treated, people of uh, Latinx people have been treated, no, no doubt about it. But race is different because of its roots in slavery, where in order to enslave human beings, you had to create a notion that they were less than human. And even our constitution counted slaves as three-fifths of a man initially. So how do we go and deal with that set of, uh, that, that set of birth marks as we move forward? Now, I would be the first to say, people who say we've made no progress, come on. I stood before a portrait of Benjamin Franklin and took an oath of office to that constitution, by the way, that once counted my ancestors three-fifths of a man, sworn in by a Jewish woman Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was my neighbor. And I thought, you know, what would Ben Franklin have thought of this? Well, you know, he probably would never have been able to imagine it. So yes, we have made progress. But we have to see how we can make progr more progress. And I think it begins with each and every one of us. Um, I've, I've asked all of my friends, you know, I don't, I don't want recrimination. I don't want white people to feel guilty. I don't need your guilt. What I need is your commitment to trying to get to a place that when someone walks in the room who is black, you don't think you know what they think. You don't think you know what their background is. You don't think you know how good they are, bad they are at various things. In other words, even if we're not colorblind and we're not likely to be, let's act as if we are. And then let's talk about the impact of race on health outcomes, the impact of race on educational outcomes, and see then how can we address uh, these, these very deep uh, issues that we face. Your, your 2017 best-selling book, uh, Democracy, uh, was an insightful look at the global struggle for democracy. Uh, three years later, uh, the challenges you wrote about seem to me more relevant than ever. Uh, it seems like uh, the current COVID-19 crisis, if anything, has exacerbated 
uh, what you call in the book the tendency for uh, isolationism. Uh, how do you think democracy is faring? Yeah. Well, I am. Um, I always am optimistic about democracy because uh, we don't have any other answer to how human beings are going to organize themselves in a way that accords with human dignity. Um, but democracy is really hard. So what are we asking people to do? We're saying we want you to trust these abstractions, these institutions, elections, and constitutions, and, uh, and institutions like courts to, to actually protect your interest and your values rather than your tribe or your village or violence to do it. And so it's very hard and it takes a long time to get there. Those institutions um, are straining right now under the stresses uh, of uh, the pandemic. Uh, they're straining under the stresses as you've just raised of racial and social injustice. But there isn't any alternative to people being able to govern themselves in this way. Ask yourself, uh, would you rather say, okay, so we'll just, we'll just lay our bets on a benign authoritarian to make things better for us. First of all, you have to count on them to be benign and you have to count on generations of them to be benign because there's no way to get rid of a dictator once you've got one. The good thing about democracy is it gives you the means to peacefully change power. And that's the most important element of democracy. Yes, it's very, very hard right now. But I think if, again, each and every one of us recognizes that democracy is not a spectator sport, you have to commit yourself to being uh, willing to play your own role, then the aggregated roles uh, will, will come to mean something. And let me say one other thing about race and democracy. Uh, it's very, very hard in the United States. But you know, when all those people were marching in places like Europe and Latin America and saying, we feel what the United States is going through, I wanted to say, look in the mirror. Show me a place in the world where difference hasn't been a problem. Um, I remember very well when I was um, secretary, the Brazilians used to say they didn't have a race problem. But you did notice that the field hands were African, the hotel staffs were mulatta and the government was Portuguese. Just happened to be that way. When uh, President Lula uh, became president of Brazil, we were talking and he said, I want to talk to you about something. He said, I want to talk to you about race. And he said, um, we, we have a problem with race in Brazil and I have to find ways to raise it. He went to issues like affirmative action in Brazil. And when he appointed his first Afro-Brazilian minister. This is in 2006 or so. First Afro-Brazilian minister. He asked me to come to the Afro-Brazilian homeland of Salvador, uh, uh, Salvador Bahia, which I did. And I recognized there how hard it was for them to get their arms around race. So let's remember that when you're asking people to self-govern and to govern wisely with those who are different, it's very difficult, and we're all on a very long journey here. Condi, as a, as a former Secretary of State, what advice would you give the next Secretary of State uh, in terms of how to best handle U.S. foreign affairs, especially now during a global pandemic? I, I would ask uh, the next Secretary of State and the next several Secretaries of State to realize uh, what a special role the United States has played in the world uh, since the end of World War II. You know, after World War II, um, a group of people, not all of them American, um, got together and they sort of looked at the world that they had just left behind, a world that had been uh, a war that had come out of um, violent conflict over resources, a, a war that had come out of an, a Great Depression in which the economy, the international economy, was considered a zero-sum game. My growth had to come at your expense. Uh, a, a world in which uh, great powers just conflicted over territory or over resources, they decided we could do better. And they tried to create uh, institutions like the United Nations on the, the political side and the IMF and the World Bank on the economic side to create 
let's call it a global commons where we would all see our interest as interlocked. When I look around the world today, and you mentioned the response to COVID-19, I have never seen the revenge of the sovereign state like this. Uh, it has been my citizens, my PPE, uh, my borders, my travel bans. The international institutions have been pushed to the sidelines. And uh, I really hope that we're going to recognize, as I think we did after the horrors of 9-11 and after the last financial crisis, that we're better in this if we can find international cooperation to deal with these challenges. I'll give you one example where I really hope we get international cooperation. If and when we're fortunate enough to find a vaccine for COVID-19, I hope it's not the Hunger Games. I hope it's not whoever got there first, uh, our citizens get access and the rest of you, well, good luck to you. Because the truth of the matter is almost all of the challenges that we're going to face, pandemics, climate change, terrorism, are borderless. And if we think of ourselves first, then we're going to miss the opportunity to work with others to make them safer and ourselves safer in the process. The United States after World War II took that view. And I know it carried a lot of burdens, but it also carried a lot of uh, benefits and successes. Well, Thank you very much, Condi, for, for your insights. It was really great talking to you, and I will look forward to seeing you on campus when the pandemic is over and life is back to normal and to continue our conversation. Yes, and if I may say to, my stu this to, to our students out there, I know this is not the college experience that you had expected, uh, but try to remember that uh, we're all in this together. Keep studying hard. Uh, this is a different experience, but hopefully you'll stay in touch with all of your friends, even if virtually, and we'll see you back on campus soon. Great. Thank you, Condi. Thank you.